Hey, happy Tuesday morning, everyone. Welcome back to Morning Musings. Thank you so much for joining me here Tuesday morning. We are continuing our study of the resurrection. The resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15. The resurrection in which corruption would put on incorruptibility, in which mortal would put on immortality, just like Paul discusses in Romans chapter 8. So we have been focused on Paul's discussion of that resurrection, that change from mortality to immortality, from corruption to incorruptibility, the, the freedom of the creation from the bondage of corruption <clears throat> and from the futility to which had been, it had been subjected. Now, let me remind you of something. This is so important. When Paul says the whole creation, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> the whole creation had been subjected to futility. As I shared with you, I, I've done an ex extensive and exhaustive word study of Matthias and Matthias and the cognates of it. And look, it's always possible that I miss something, but Matthias and Matthias, so far as I have been able to determine, there is not a single place in all of the Bible, especially in the New Testament, but there's not a single place in the New Testament in which that word ever refers to physical creation longing to be free from some kind of a curse. Now again, do we find the promise of a new creation? Yes, but is it the promise of a physical new creation? No, it's not. And on that, I recommend highly that you get a copy of Dan Derry's new book, The Transition Between Two Covenants. Go to my websites and order that. You'll be amazed that there is absolutely, there's just no evidence for the idea of physical creation longing to be free from its current state. No, no, it's, you know, it's just not there, folks. I'm sorry. It's just not there. Okay. <clears throat> now, I suggested to you in yesterday's video that we have to keep in mind that Paul's doctrine of the adoption, the time of the redemption of the body, the time in which creation's futility would be over, the time in which the bondage of corruption would be over, okay, is when God's promises to Israel would be fulfilled. The promise of the adoption belonged to Israel, Israel after the flesh, Romans 9, 1 to 3. That's undeniable. Now, it doesn't mean that the promise was not outside of Israel also. It simply points out that Israel had become the focus. You know, Adam and Eve wanted to be free from their bondage, wanted to be from, free from their futility, i.e. their alienation from God. Their alienation, the alienation of all men, became centered in, focused in, <clears throat> Israel under Torah. Now, I shared with you Isaiah 26 and Israel's futility under Torah under law. She wanted deliverance, but she did not get it. She was like a woman in travail, a woman in labor pains, but not bringing forth deliverance. We have more to say about that. It's critical in Romans 8. But look at Isaiah 49 in the context of this vanity. Remember, folks, <clears throat> Matiotis doesn't mean fleas that are longing to be eagles. <laughs> okay? It's not a slug that desires to be a polar bear. Matiotis is the futility, a moral futility, of not achieving a goal, not achieving a purpose having a desire to be, to accomplish something, to reach that goal 
and never reaching it. You know, as far as I can determine, science has not been able to find a single ant that wants to be an elephant. Just don't have that. Okay. <clears throat> and again, Isaiah 26 is the backdrop. Now notice Isaiah 49. As, as Yahweh said, listen, O coastlands, to, to me and take heed, you people from afar. He's saying to the nations, listen to me. He's not saying this to Israel. These are the nations far off. The Lord has called me from the womb. And he's speaking of Israel corporately. The Lord has called me. From the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver. He has hidden me. And he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel. Now, I tell you, the scholars really struggle over this. Is he, in fact, speaking of corporate Israel or is he now speaking of Messiah as the representative? I kind of still lean toward corporate Israel here, and here's why. You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But watch this. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Now, I don't think he's talking about Messiah there, okay? I think he's talking about Israel under the law. I think he's talking about Isaiah 26. Israel laboring to bring forth deliverance and not reaching it. So here is Israel saying, I have labored in vain. I've spent my money in vanity. Well, you know, we kind of get Isaiah 55 here <clears throat> in which Israel is called upon and the Lord says, do not spend your money for that which perishes. Come to me <clears throat> and follow me and I'll give you water. I'll give you bread that satisfies. Do not spend your money. Do not spend your efforts for that which can never satisfy. Vanity of vanities. Now keep in mind, folks, it is Israel that Paul said the promise of deliverance from futility had been given. And it was the nations watching Israel, Isaiah 49.1. Pay attention, O nations far off. Pay attention to what I'm doing in Israel. Why would the nations pay attention to what God was doing in Israel? In Israel and for Israel. It is because when God accomplished in Israel and for Israel, that deliverance from futility, it meant that the nations would receive that deliverance as well. And here's the beauty of Isaiah 49. That deliverance, that deliverance from futility would be in the day of the Messiah. It would be in the time that the Lord says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you, I will, and I will give you, this Messiah, now watch this, as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages that you may say to the prisoners, go forth. Those who are in darkness, show yourselves. Deliverance. The end of futility. Oh, wait. Here is God promising Israel the days of their futility would be over in the day of salvation, in which Messiah would, get, would be the covenant for them. Do you remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? 
He cites Isaiah 49, 6 and following verbatim and says, Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Now watch this, folks. If Isaiah 49 is predicting the time of the deliverance of creation from futility, pardon me, in the day of salvation, if that day of deliverance from futility is in fact the day of the adoption, the resurrection. Then when Paul wrote to the, pardon me, to the Corinthians and said, now is the acceptable time, today is the day of salvation, that could only mean one thing. It meant the day of the adoption, the acceptable time, the day of salvation, the day of the resurrection had arrived in the first century. And that deliverance was coming through Jesus. He would be the one to end the futility of Israel under law and the nations afar off under their own conscience and under their own futility. Jesus is the end of our moral futility. And he would be the covenant to bring that around. Go to my website and order Dan Derry's really, really good book, The Transition Between Two Covenants. That's what this is. That's what Isaiah 49 is. The transition from the old covenant of futility to the new covenant of life and deliverance and salvation in Christ. Order the book. You'll be glad you did. And we've got more. So we'll see you on the flip side.